Hello everyone! In this video we will find out about some key rules according to which irreduced superrepresentations are named. So no more mystery behind B1G. So let's start with letters A, B, E and T. I already told you that A and B representations have 1 by 1 transformation matrices, E has 2 by 2 and T 3 by 3 transformation matrices. When a square matrix is n by n, it's called n-dimensional. So A and B representations are called 1-dimensional, E and T 2 and 3-dimensional respectively. So could you tell me please what is the dimensionality of G and H representations? If you need to, then please pause the video. So G is 4-dimensional and H is 5-dimensional. How do we know that? Well, the dimensionality can be seen under E operation, because E operation does nothing, so the character is equal to the number of entities related by symmetry. Also, some of you may think that 5-dimensional matrix has to describe 5 space coordinates, you know, higher dimensions, parallel universes and whatnot. But 5x5 five five matrix can be, for instance, used to solve 5 equations with 5 unknowns. So let's treat matrices as a mathematical tool, uh, and I know it might sound silly for some of you, but uh, it might be a valid question for others. Last detail I want to mention is that all transformation matrices are always square, since the number of vectors or functions is not changed by any symmetry operation, and I'm sure that you've noticed that already. There is another term that you might have heard regarding representations. One-dimensional representations are also called singly degenerate, two-dimensional, doubly degenerate, and so on. You have heard the term degenerate during quantum chemistry course. When the two orbitals have the same energy, they are said to be degenerate. So let's first realize that carrying out the symmetry operation of a molecule must leave the energy of the molecule unchanged, since the final configuration must be physically indistinguishable from the original one. And now, if a k set of orbitals have the same energy, then they form a basis for a k-dimensional irreduced superrepresentation. It goes both ways. If a set of k orbitals form a basis for a k-dimensional representation, then they have the same energy. So now it's a time for question for you. Do all p orbitals on oxygen in water molecule have the same energy? The answer is no, because all p orbitals are under different representations. How about p orbitals on carbon in methane? In methane they have the same energy because they are under one representation, T2. One way to think about it is that in a free atom all p orbitals have the same energy. And of course the same goes for a set of d orbitals and so on. The moment the central atom starts to interact with ligands, the degeneracy might be lifted, depending on the symmetry of the resulting molecule. So to sum up, if a molecule belongs to a group where representations are only A and B, then all the P orbitals and all the D orbitals have different energies. So let's look at C2V table again. As we said before, dx squared minus y squared and 2z squared minus x squared minus y squared are both under A1, because we can construct them from the terms under A1. So both of these orbitals behave in the same way under symmetry operations present in C2V group, but the energies are different. So let's move on to E operations. As we said in the previous video, presence of CN or SN axis with N equals 3 or higher means that a group has E representations. In such cases, we might expect some degeneracy. You just need to check with the character table which E representation describes the orbitals that you are interested in. For instance, in D7 group, we have three E representations and E3 does not describe any P or D orbitals. We also know that T representations are present only in cubic groups. In these groups, P orbitals are always degenerate and D orbitals split into two sets, except for I and I age groups where all the orbitals are under one representation, so they have the same energy. Now, in some books you might come across so-called accidental degeneracy. Accidental degeneracy refers to degeneracy which is not a result of symmetry, it's accidental. It is thought that usually it indicates the presence of hidden symmetry, which is not apparent. Some state that accidental degeneracy is not at all accidental. For the purpose of this video, it's enough that we are aware that the term exists. Let's move to subscripts. Subscript 1 is given when an irreduced superrepresentation is symmetric under C2 axis perpendicular to the principal axis. If that is not present, symmetric under sigma v. Symmetric means that there is plus 1 under the operation that the rules are talking about. If there is minus 1, then the representation is called anti-symmetric with respect to the mesh operations and the subscript 2 is given. So let's put our knowledge into practice. How we would label these representations? Let's first look under E operation. We have two, so we know that it's E representation. The first two lines have one, so it can be either A or B. So we need to look at the second column. A is symmetric and the principal axis of rotation, so it turns out that both representations are A's. However, we cannot have two representations labeled in the same way in a group. So now let's use one and two labels. We see that the first A is symmetric under C2, so it's A1, and the second is anti-symmetric 
metric, so is A2. It doesn't require a subscript, because it's the only representation of its kind in the table. With C3D group, the situation is almost identical, only now we need to distinguish A's by looking at the sigma vertical, because C3D group does not have any axis perpendicular to the main axis. So let's introduce some more symbols. Prime and double prime are used to describe symmetric and antisymmetric behavior with respect to sigma horizontal. So let's do some examples. Assigning E representation is easy. We can see 2 under E operation. Then the rest of the entries under E operation are plus 1. So they're either A's or B's. So we look under the main axis of rotation, C3, so we see that all the entries are plus 1, so they are all A's. Then we might look under sigma horizontal, the first three entries are plus 1, that means we have symbol prime, and the last three entries are antisymmetric under sigma H, so that gives symbol double prime. Now for E representations, we don't need to do anything else, because we can distinguish them now. But it's not the end of the story with A's. We will give them additional subscript 1 or 2. So let's look under C2 perpendicular to the main axis. So the first representation ends up being A prime 1, and so on. The last symbols that we will mention are G and U. They are used to describe symmetric and antisymmetric behavior with respect to inversion. So let's tackle some example. Again, E representation, easy, then the rest of the representations are singly degenerate. Let's look under the main axis of rotation to see if there are A's or B's. This time there are some entries with minus 1, so we have some B's as well. Now, the group has both inversion and reflection in a sigma horizontal. In cases like that, the inversion overrides the reflection, so we will have G and U labels. First five representations are symmetric under inversion, which gives G subscript. And the last five representations have subscript U, because they are antisymmetric with respect to the inversion. So we are done with E representations, but we need some more symbols to distinguish somehow between one-dimensional representations. So let's look under axis perpendicular to the main axis, C2 prime. It's not C2, because C2 is also along that axis, and it's not C2 prime prime, which is perpendicular, but in between x and y axis. So C2 prime prime is considered lower in rank, so to speak. So as I said, we look under C2 prime, assign subscript 1 and 2, and we are done. Now, for linear groups, the symbols are a bit different, but the good news is that some tables use both systems to avoid confusion, and we'll not be doing any examples here. So, so far we've done few examples, and assigning symbols to representations seems to be easy. However, it's not always that easy. Let's look at TD group. We can see that there is one E representation, two T representations, and two singly degenerate representations. So we look under the main axis, both representations are symmetric under the main axis of rotation, so they are A's. Now, to decide if the A's are 1 or 2, we need to look under sigma D, which is vertical with respect to C3. Because notice that C2 is not perpendicular to C3, so it's all logical so far. Far. However, to distinguish between T's, we need to look under S4 in proper rotation. As Cotton says, often subscripts for multidimensional representations follow different rules. He points out that some mathematical development would be needed in order to explain them. There are two last things that I would like to point out. Notice that in every table, the first irreducible representation has plus 1 in every entry. This representation is called fully symmetric. So what? Well, it always describes S orbital, it always describes so called fully symmetric stretch, it always describes combination of orbitals that are fully in phase. Here we can see some examples of such modes or orbital combinations for molecules which have OH and D4H symmetry. Just so we can compare, here are some examples of stretches or combinations of orbitals that are not so fully symmetric. Fully symmetric representation is very prevalent, except in bending modes. So let's look for instance at this D4H molecule, we can immediately see that all four angles cannot increase at the same time, so this is invalid solution for this type of problems. It doesn't matter if you don't understand the examples that I'm showing you, but I just want you to spot that the first representation in the character table will be always fully symmetric. The last thing that I would like you to notice is that every representation has different symbols. Therefore, every irreducible representation has characteristic symmetry properties. So we can say that every irreducible representation defines a symmetry species. Any vectors or functions forming a basis for any irreducible representation is said to belong to that symmetry species. So for D2H group, for instance, RZ and DXY belong to the same symmetry species. So that's all I have for you. Thank you for watching. Bye!